O Lord God of hosts, who is mighty as you are, O Lord, with your faithfulness all around you? You rule the raging of the sea. When its waves rise, you still them. You crushed Rahab like a carcass. You scattered your enemies with your mighty arm. The heavens are yours. The earth also is yours. The world and all that is in it. You have founded them. The north and the south you have created. Tabor and Hermon joyously praise your name. You have a mighty arm. Strong is your hand. High your right hand. Righteousness and justice are the foundation of your throne. Steadfast love and faithfulness go before you. Blessed are the people who know the festal shout, who walk, O Lord, in the light of your face. Let's pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, thank you so much for everything you're doing in and around us. God, we ask for the filling of the Holy Spirit to come so that we may give you praise and worship you in the splendor of holiness, God. We love you, Lord, and may all our praises give you all the honor and glory that you so richly deserve. In Jesus' name, amen.
Gracious Heavenly Father, again, we just thank you so much. We thank you for that time of worship. We thank you. We thank you just for you, God. We're so thankful for you, and there is nothing that we could ever grasp in this life more precious, more valuable than a relationship with Christ Jesus. Thank you, God, for everything. 
And Lord, we just ask, I ask to get out of the way, and Lord, speak to us this morning. In the power of the Holy Spirit, Lord, come and reveal truth. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, Liberty. Last week, short review, we talked about the importance of unity in the church. We've been going through Philippians. That's been a major theme is unity. And we talked about ways you could maintain it. And it's not, it's one of those things that's easier to talk about than it is to implement, right? Because you have to be humble and you have to be truthful. So humility, yes, it's, it's cheap to talk about, expensive to practice. Very much so. It's that deep and subtle perspective of the mind. And you can't just boil it down to simply an action. There are humble actions, but they stem from a humble attitude, a humble demeanor. It's an attitude that doesn't consider itself first. It thinks of others. It's a lowliness of mind. It's, it's free from pride and arrogance. It's not concerned with being number one. Another way we saw to maintain unity is to give up selfish ambitions. And I cannot think of a more countercultural point to the American ideology than that. In a, in a culture that prizes ambition, we're supposed to come out from among them and be separate. It's truly better to serve than to be exalted. Do you believe that? Amen. We need to be people of the Bible. We need to stand on the truth of God, eager to maintain the unity in the Spirit. And at the same time, more of what we'll be talking about today, we need to stand on the truth of God and not shirk back from it whenever it might cause division. So I thought it would be a good segue, with it being October 31st, to talk about a historical event. Today, we're taking a break from Philippians, and we'll be in Romans, Romans chapter 3, because this day, October 31st, marks the 504th anniversary of the Protestant Reformation. Protestant Reformation. So if, you're one of the, if you don't like to talk about Halloween, say, hey, happy Reformation Day. It works. It works. So this message is going to be more historical in some ways than what we're used to. Uh, so if you are visiting, I, I don't want you to think this is the norm. I'm not, this isn't the church that just talks about the Catholics every week. But today I thought it would be relevant and we could glean something from it. So again, We'll come back to Philippians, but this passage of Scripture that we're looking at in Romans 3, it's Romans 3, uh, 21 through 28, contains some of the most beautiful words in the entire Bible. I believe Martin Lloyd-Jones called it the Acropolis of the Christian faith, right here. Everything you need to know about salvation is right here. So before we get into this passage, some of you are like, Protestant Reformation, what is that? What is that? Protestant sounds like another word, right? Let's break it down. How about protest? Okay, a protest is uh, it's, it's speaking out against something, correct? Someone who protests is speaking out against some sort of injustice or uh, something that is not true. So a Protestant is someone protesting. As for the other word, the root of it is reform. Reformation, reform, which means to improve from correction or error, deviation. It means to remove of defects and not just remove of them, but also leave something better in its place. So the Protestant Reformation, we can see what the intention was, a protest against a deviation from the truth of God as found in the scriptures. So as much as humility matters and unity matters, guys, some aspects of the truth are important enough to divide on, and this is one of those issues. So in the 16th century, a German monk named Martin Luther led this charge against the Roman Catholic Church regarding several issues he had with the teachings of the church. In 1517, Martin Luther posted his 95 theses on the door of the castle church in Wittenberg. What was the primary issue for Luther and the other protesters? Well, I'm glad you asked me. <laughs> the issue was there, are, there, were, there were several grievances with the Roman Catholic Church at the time. But the primary concern was this doctrine, this understanding of justification. 
how is a person made right with God? How, how does God justify? And that's the reason for the sermon title, How God Justifies. I, I hope we can answer that question this morning. And this, again, you know, I, I recommended a book called Finding the Right Hills to Die On. This is a hill to die on. This is that important of an issue. This is foundational to the Christian faith. But before I get ahead of myself, let's go ahead and read it. So Romans chapter 3, verses 21 through 28. I love this passage so much, I can't wait to come back and preach it again. Let me tell you. But now the righteousness of God has been manifested apart from the law. Although the law and the prophets bear witness to it, the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. For there is no distinction. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God put forward as a propitiation by his blood to be received by faith. And this was to show God's righteousness because in his divine forbearance he had passed over former sins. It was to show his righteousness at the present time so that he might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. Then what becomes of our boasting? It is excluded. By what kind of law? By a law of works? No, but by the law of faith. For we hold that one is justified by faith, by faith apart from works of the law. That's the reading of God's word today. I've heard several, like I said earlier, I've heard several ministers refer to this passage as the apex passage of the Christian faith. It's dealing with this fundamental truth that every one of us needs to hold close and dear to our heart. So notice in the first verse, but now the righteousness of God has been manifested apart from the law. Apart. That is a righteousness not like our own. This is a sense of goodness. Remember the goodness of God? This is a sense of goodness on the person. And we're not capable of achieving it. And it exists apart from the law. It's a righteousness not achieved by our acts of obedience. We can't earn it. This is not to say that the gospel equals lawlessness. Your mind's already went there. We'll get to that. Trust me, we'll get to that. But it does mean that the righteousness God requires must come from outside of us. We're not capable of achieving it on our own. And even uh, the prophets being, being um, un explained in the New Testament understanding of Hebrews says the blood of bulls and goats was not satisfy the wrath of God. It doesn't satisfy the sins that we've sown. So some theologians call this this righteousness, an alien righteousness, an alien righteousness. And there's this Latin phrase, extra nos, extra nos. So a good way to understand this is what, what, do, we, what do we call aliens? Some of you like Martians, what? <laughs> Foreigners. <laughs> I'm thinking more uh, science fiction aliens here. <laughs> Need to extraterrestrials, right? An extraterrestrial is an alien. Extra. E extra means coming from outside, right? Strangers from the outside. Aliens exist outside of Earth. They're out there. The nos would refer to the self. This righteousness is extra nos in the sense that it comes from outside of us. We don't have it in and of ourselves. And that brings us to the first point. True conversion means turning not only from sin, but also from depending on self-made righteousness. Self-made goodness. That is a quote from the great evangelist George Whitfield. It's beautiful. It, it sums up this passage that we're talking about well. And I mean, talk about a life devoted to the gospel. This man, if you, if you want good works, this man, George Whitfield had good works. And he still said this. He still recognized that this righteousness that he needed to be right with God 
came from outside of himself. We would do good to remember that. We must turn not only from sin. That's repentance, turning away from sin and turning to God. That's repentance. We turn away from sin, and we also turn away from trusting in ourselves. Trusting in ourselves. We need that alien righteousness. The good that we do will never save us. We must not only turn away from that, but we also have to turn away from thinking that things that I do will earn me favor with God. That's a hard concept, isn't it? It's not about what I do. It's about how great and good my God is. So look at verses 22 and 23. The righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. For there is no distinction. And then this second verse that we've all heard several times. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. All is pretty covering. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Sin is the rejection of God and a failure to honor God as more valuable than everything else. Sin is rebellion against God. So in Romans, just for context, we're not going through Romans, but this should be helpful for how Paul got to this point. He spends the first two chapters making this case against all of humanity. Every single person born under the sun stands condemned before God. The world is condemned already. He begins in chapter 1 discussing the fallen nature, nature of Gentiles and how we can see people do this. They don't have graved carbon images, but we definitely have idols in this culture. Don't be fooled. And how they exchange the glory of God for images resembling mortal men and birds and animals and creeping things. They're there. And this natural man, this natural state is at enmity or against Enmity means against God. And he goes on to describe them as exchanging the truth of God, these Gentiles, for a lie and worshiping what? The creation as opposed to the creator. So if you're reading this letter, you got this, and you're a Jew in Rome, and you're like, yes, yes, get him, Paul, get him. And then Paul, in chapter 2 of Romans, says, I'm talking about you too. He just knocks the legs right off of that. He says, you're not any better, Jew. But but we're we're of Abraham. We're of Abraham. We have the oracles of God. No. You see, we we, we learned a lot about this going through the book of Luke, right? It's not about your ethnicity. It's not about your origins. The flesh profits Something? Nothing. It is the life in the spirit that is pleasing to God. So to sum it up, the point that Paul is making in this letter is that neither the Jew nor the Gentile, which covers everybody, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. That's everybody. There's no one that does good and no one can earn favor with God by their actions. There is none righteous. Now we just sang about the holiness of God, didn't we? There is no one like you. Holy. Open up my eyes in wonder. Holy is the Lord. Holy, holy, holy. And that literally means, the word for holy means to cut. To separate. God is so much more other than us. And that's why he's referred to as holy, holy, holy. See, if you wanted to emphasize something in uh, Jewish language, you didn't say very or really, really. You said it repetitively. Holy, holy, holy. God is super, 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 really, 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 truly, truly, truly separate from us. King David writes in Psalm 51, verse 5, he says, Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. There it is. That's the state of every person. You're born dead in sin. We're not born God seekers. We don't come out of the womb with a natural inclination, a natural bent toward God. We have a bent toward 
the world. So we've kind of built a case here. We've built a description of man. We've built a description of God. And you might be starting to see a problem. Here's the problem for man when it comes to the topic of being right, how God justifies people. Mankind's problem is not that God is evil. Did you ever consider this? The problem is not that God is evil. The problem is that God is good. And we naturally aren't. That's an issue. So in the psalm earlier, righteousness and justice surround his throne. Righteousness. He's not a corrupt judge. He's a just judge. You can pay off a corrupt judge. If you're a mobster and you got a lot of money, you go into court, you can pay the judge off. But what happens when they replace the judge and it's a just judge? That mobster's going to jail. God is just. He can't overlook things. Because if he does, he ceases from being just, right? And I've used this illustration before, but consider somebody doing some heinous crime against, against a close relative. Let's, let's say it's murder. And you're sitting in the court, and that guy's on trial, and then the judge gets up there and he says, you know what, I'm feeling really merciful today. All evidence points to this guy did it. The judge gets up there and says, you know what, I'm feeling really merciful today. You can go free. And if that's your relative, you're going to be filled with rage indignant against that unjust judge who did not provide you justice. Correct? So God has to deal with sin. If he just, oh, that's okay. If he makes, a, if he makes exceptions, then he's no longer just. Where is the peace? This is the question. For the sinner, it is a terrifying thing to fall into the hands of the living God. Is it not? Where is the peace? Where is our hope if none are righteous and none do good? Where's the hope? That brings us to Rome. What was Rome teaching that needed to be protested? What was Rome teaching that needed to be reformed? And that comes, we'll come to the second point. Justification is the article by which the church stands or falls. That's commonly attributed to Luther, but I, I'm not certain he said it. But it's definitely a paraphrase of what he taught. Article by which the church stands or falls. What does this mean? Stands or falls. So we have not yet defined justification this morning. We talk about it a lot, but... For the sake of review, now would be a good time to, you know, get in tune with our terms. It is the act, in the simplest form, is the act of being made right with God. The act of being declared righteous. Justification is the declaration of the believing sinner to be just, and it comes from this imputed or this uh, applied, applied righteousness to the person, and it's the righteousness of Christ. It's the good, and you see a lot of people like, Jesus died for me. Jesus died for me. Yes, he did. He also lived for you. Don't forget that. He also lived for you. That's that imputed righteousness. By faith, Christ's righteousness, again, and this righteousness, did it come from me? No, it was applied. It was from outside. This extra nos, this alien righteousness, it came to me by faith. And it's legally accredited to the account of the sinner. And the word declared is important. So we're like, well, I'm not, I still sin, right? I, I still mess up. Well, guess what? This is, this is good news for you. Declared, it means you're not completely righteous yet. But in the eyes of God, you are. You are justified and a sinner at the same time. And if my Latin was stronger, I could use another phrase, but I won't try it. <laughs> the longer we walk in the Holy Spirit, the more he sanctifies us, church. Right? 
we as believers in Christ same in the sh- share in the same righteous status that Jesus Christ has before God the Father. That's amazing. This righteousness covers you entirely. So when the Father sees you, he sees the righteousness of Christ. There's one of my sons. There's one of my daughters. Blood bought. Justification is also instant and irrevocable. God has declared you righteous at conversion, and he won't take it away. That's not how that works. What does this have to do with Rome? Some of you are still wondering, what does this have to do with Rome? And I'm not trying to beat up on Rome. I'm just pointing something out. So we bring it all together. This is not at all what the Roman Catholic Church was teaching at this time in the 16th century. Not even close. Now this is tricky because we can find ourselves using, if if you're talking with a Catholic, you can find yourself using the same terms. By the way, I was raised Catholic for like six years until I was taken out of the school. Now, I guess I called myself a Catholic, but we didn't, we didn't practice. But, so maybe that means I can speak to this? I don't know. That, that was the point of that? Sorry. So, and it took me a long time to learn this. You're using the same language, but you mean different things. So when a Catholic says justification, they lump in things that Protestants are accused of separating. Regeneration, justification, sanctification are all over here in separate functions, separate areas, different terms. They mean different things. Regeneration means one thing. Justification means another. And sanctification means another. To the Catholic, justification means all three of those things lumped together, and they all work to save you. So the position, what that equals is, so, so if, we, if we have an understanding of justification is God declares someone righteous, and then sanctification is becoming more and more righteous by good works through the Holy Spirit. Do the math. The Catholic Church teaches that faith and works are what save people. That's the issue. That's the issue. Protestants contend that justification is completely and totally an act of God. My works are not part of what saves me. It is righteousness granted to me by faith. They are acts of worship in response to what God has done for me. And we'll talk about that more in detail in a minute. Now, I'm not, again, I'm not trying to pick on the Roman Catholic Church. I'm, I'm certain that many of you might have roots with, associated with them. But, guys, we cannot diminish the importance of this issue. Luther had a good point. And Luther's goal was never, get this, we've been talking about unity, Luther's goal was never to separate. Did you know that? He wanted to reform the Catholic Church. He didn't want to deviate from it. But this issue was not reconcilable. There was too much corruption in the church at that time during the Reformation, and so... I, 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 even the Catholic Church today has to admit, they might not, that the Reformation was good for them too because there was a lot of corruption going on. Lots. For example, during this time, the church was offering indulgences. This mixed in with the Catholic understanding of purgatory. So we've all heard of purgatory And that's that in-between place that the sinner goes in order to get refined to where they can be right with God. Could be 30 years, could be 30 million years. You don't know. Of course, we disagree. I I like the words of the scriptures that say to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. An indulgence was an offering of money one could give to the church to pay for their sins or with the goal, in many cases, of shortening the span of time for a past relative in purgatory. 
And just, it just so happened, big coincidence right here, that Pope Julius II was trying to raise money to redo St. Peter's Basilica. No comment. So one of these corrupt monks, Johann Tetzel, John Tetzel, famous for this, infamous for this phrase, as soon as the coin in the coffer rings, or the kettle, this is the giving kettle, the soul from purgatory springs. He would make a good uh, commercial today, wouldn't he? <laughs> Hear that Billy Mays guy like saying that. How do you know, you might be thinking, how do you know this guy was corrupt? Well, if, if that's not enough for you, we have a historical account of him accepting an indulgence from a man regarding a sin that he was yet to commit. Here's my money. I'm going to go now. This is actually one of the events that enraged Martin Luther to the point to where he nailed the 95 theses on the castle door of the castle of Wittenberg. Another misconception, so I'm going to play a little defense for Catholics because I've heard Protestants say this. Well, you guys believe that salvation is by works and we believe that salvation is by faith. No. They would say faith and works. Faith and works. But we disagree strongly. It's a synthesized understanding. Both, work, or both are working to save you. So let's look at verses 24 and 26 again. I want to be faithful to, this, to the text. And, tr- and I, could, I could preach on this text next week and get something completely else out of it. It's, it's just that good. Verse 24, And are justified, sinners are justified by his grace as a gift, through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God put forward as a propitiation by his blood. Important word, propitiation. This was to show God's righteousness because in his divine forbearance he had passed over former sins. It was to show his righteousness at the present time so that he might be both just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. Now, consider this in light of what Rome teaches. How does this line up? This is the Bible. This is, this is what the Word of God is saying. How is, it, how is this line up? If, if Christ is the just and the justifier, how are my works working to justify me? It's not making sense. How is a person made right with God? And this is why this article, this issue of justification is where the church stands or falls because you're augmenting the entire message of the good news. How can I know? That's another question you have to ask yourself. If it's my faith and my works that save me, how can I know that my works are good enough to save me? What if I mess it up? How can I have peace? How can I have peace? Did Jesus pay it some? Jesus just paid some of it. And it's up to me. The ball's in my court. I've got to pay the rest. Now consider this word propitiation in verses 24. I don't know why some translations changed the word. I have ideas. Some have exchanged it with expiation. I won't go into that. But essentially propitiation means... A, an appeasing of wrath, an atoning sacrifice that appeases wrath. And I, perhaps they didn't want to think about God as having wrath. I don't know. But God's wrath is also glorious because it's wrath against sin. It's wrath against evil, just and righteous. So God's war- wrath, consider this as satisfied in the work of Jesus Christ. Completely and totally satisfied. Jesus really did pay it all. Jesus, you you might surrender some, Jesus paid it all. If Christ paid for all of your salvation, what's left to be owed? 
That's simple. That's simple transaction. If I owe somebody $100 and then a friend of mine steps in and says, you know what, I'm going to pay the bill and you don't owe me anything. I just want to do it. And he gives the person $100. What am I left to owe? Nothing. Nothing. You didn't know Christianity had math, did you? How much more is the grace of God put on full display in the atoning work of Jesus Christ for sinners than a measly hundred dollars? Paid in full. And justification, another reason that I think that this is so important is because Christianity is the only religion that puts justification on the front end. Front end. You can have it now, declared righteous. Now. As opposed to, hopefully you'll be good enough to please Allah. Hopefully you'll be good enough to reach nirvana. Hopefully, 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 there's no peace. There's no peace. Where's the hope? So, point number three. We are saved by faith alone. Some of you have been waiting for this. But the faith that saves is never alone. The faith that saves is never alone. This is, this is the problem. This, this is the butthead issue. So the quote, the quote is commonly attributed to Martin Luther. And, and you know, when, when, if, if a practicing Roman Catholic was sitting in here right now listening to me, this is what they're thinking about. But you're, you don't believe you have to do anything. That's wrong. James says it's wrong. Your, the Bible says it's wrong. Faith without works is dead. You're right. I agree. We just think it means a different thing. So consider this. And, and again, I'll say this real quickly. If you're the person that couldn't wait to get to this point, you might want to check your heart. Seriously, if, if, if you have this attitude of tell me what to do to be right with God, then you might be on a performance treadmill. You might not be resting in the grace of God. Meditate on the grace of God. I am what I am. Christian faith is a personal act on the part of the believer. It's a response in trust to God. Faith that saves is a trusting faith. I believe you, God. Through faith we receive Christ who satisfies that righteous requirement that we owe in the law. Every single one. Not some of it, not part of it, all of it. Now, works. Any conversation that you have with a Roman Catholic will inevitably go to James chapter 2. And they will tell you, you don't think we have to do anything. Faith without works is dead. What are you talking about? And again, I could not agree more. We just have a different understanding. We have a different understanding of works. So again, do works help to justify in the eyes of God? I ask you, product of the Protestant Reformation Church, do works justify you? Good. Because that would be completely contradictory to the teachings of the scriptures. The rest of the Old and the New Testament is overwhelmingly stronger about people being justified by faith apart from works. It's not good to trust in your works for salvation. It's also not good to trust in a dead faith. Now here's the challenge to you. Evidence of true saving faith will be made manifest by the actions that will follow. It's easy to put on the Sunday dress, isn't it? It's not evidence of a dead faith is that you're on church on Sunday, but you're a demon the rest of the week. And I, 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 that's, I know that's shocking, but you need to think about that. If I'm living like a demon the rest of the week, do I have true saving faith? A heart regenerated by the Holy Spirit will bear good fruit. 
That is good works. Because, again, we are his workmanship. And that's a quote from Ephesians chapter 2. We are his workmanship. We are he's crafted as we are made for good works that we get to walk in, that he's prepared beforehand. So the question is this. If we say we have faith but we don't desire any of the things of God, do we have a real, genuine, saving faith? What kind of faith is that? That's cheap grace. That's cheap grace. James is saying a dead faith is not true faith. And if you don't desire the things of God, here's the next um, question for you. If you don't desire the things of God, if the lust of the flesh and the, uh, the lust of the eyes and the pride of life is more fascinating to you than the Holy One of Heaven, how can you have any security that your faith is genuine saving faith? You can't. You can't. So consider these last two verses. Then what becomes of our boasting? What is it? What what becomes of boasting? It is excluded. By what kind of law? By a law of works? No, but by the law of faith. For we hold that one is justified by faith apart from works of the law. You see how clear this language is? Do you see what he's saying? If I was justified by works and faith, if you were justified by works and faith, you know what you could do? You could boast. You could boast because your works helped you get to heaven. Well, too bad for the other guy. I guess he didn't work as hard as me. I'm pretty awesome. Well done, me and God, high five. See the problem there? If, I, if, I, if it leaves room for boasting then it's not the true gospel because the true gospel leaves no room for boasting. None at all. None at all. Human achievement goes out the window when it comes to the grace of God. You see, these implications, again, they're talking about these hills to die on. These implications are just too vast to reconcile, guys. They're too far apart. Saying faith and works saves us when the Bible says that Jesus paid for your sins and justified you is so contradictory to the gospel message that we just can't shake hands. I think the desire of the reformers is still to do that with the Catholic Church today. But this issue is still at hand. You see, saying faith and works saves us when the Bible tells us that Jesus paid it all is blatant contradiction. Mark 10, 45 says, for even as the Son of Man came not to be served but to serve, consider this word, gave his life as a ransom for many. A ransom. You know what a ransom is? A ransom is a price paid to free the guilty from their debt. You free the debtor from their debt by paying a ransom that they couldn't pay on their own. It's beautiful. He's not your, your he's, he's, that's why we call him Savior. Lord and Savior. Savior, rescuer. His wounds have paid my ransom. And this topic is the entire issue of the letter to the Galatians. If you want some further study, read Galatians. Paul tells us that whoever preaches a different gospel, look out. This is very strong language. This is why the gospel is worth dividing on. Whoever preaches a different gospel other than one that I was entrusted by God with, whether an angel or any authority, I don't care if he's the best charismatic teacher, prophet, whatever in the world, I don't care who he is, let that person be accursed. If he preaches a message contrary to the gospel of God, that we entrusted to you from God. And he could say that because he was an apostle. It's worth being fought over. It's worth protecting because it's such glorious news. It's such glorious news. The gospel is the good news indeed. And how fundamental can you get with it? John 3, 16. For God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever works for him, whosoever believes, will not perish, 
but have eternal life. Faith. Abraham believed God, and it was a credit to him as righteousness. True repentance happens when we turn away from our sins and trusting in ourselves to trusting in God. Amen? Justification is of the utmost importance when it comes to the gospel because it deals directly with the issue of how someone is saved. How are you saved? Is it me and God or is it all God? So how does God justify? He does it by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, to the glory of God alone. And the truth of God that we know that is found in the scriptures alone. Those are the five solas of the Protestant Reformation. It's not a burden to obey. That genuine faith will never remain alone. It will always have works to follow it, but they're not works of burden. They're works of joy and privilege. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, thank you so much for everything that you're doing in and around us. Lord, we don't say these things in order to be right, or to bash people that we disagree with. We say them in love. We speak the truth in love because more than we even love unity and how good and pleasant it is when brothers dwell in unity, more than that, we long for your truth and your glory and you just you. God, we love you. Help us to love those around us, to speak lovingly, and to live lives as living sacrifices to you because you are infinitely worth it, resting in the truth that Christ Jesus paid every single transgression that we have done, past, present, and future. What a Savior. How glorious. We love you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm going to read you a scripture, and then I'm going to send you out. Because I can't put it any clearer than this. Therefore, therefore, listen up, since we have been justified by faith, We have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. And may the Lord bless you and keep you and make his face to shine upon you. Go in peace in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Happy Reformation Day.